is it working? Hello. So, hi, everyone. Is everyone uh, ready to start? OK, so um, welcome to this workshop about dependency injections um, and uh, design patterns. Uh, great to see so many of you here. Uh, the room is full. This is, uh, for us, it's great to see. Uh, this workshop today is, um, we started it to, to introduce or um, maybe um, craft a bit better to, to um, let you introduce you design patterns of better programming. For me, uh, personal, uh, I'm a developer um, and I've been working with WordPress for a very long time, but I sometimes miss the things I see in other frameworks like Laravel or Symfony. But simply because I work with WordPress so much, I don't get a chance to really exploit uh, the cool stuff that happens there. So this is why uh, me and Elaine um, have started this workshop. Um, some, some minor uh, things. Uh, we are short on power supply. Uh, so we might uh, have to ask in the, in the break if we need to reschedule some people if you're out of power. So if you are near a socket, uh, try to work on the socket now so that the rest of the workshop you can do on your battery. Sorry for that. Um, so about this workshop. Um, what we wanted to do is is do something that might be useful in real life. So no, we're not going to do um, uh, ducks or, or cars or something like that. We're going to work on something that's actually uh, useful. The workshop is... Um, uh, is done in pair programming, so the person you're sitting next to is going to be the person you'll be uh, working with uh, during this workshop. And um, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to uh, fake a project, um, and we're going to introduce business requirements. And what we're going to do is, is we're going to discuss this requirement, and we're going to explain what the requirement is and what kind of design pattern or PHP standard thing could help with this. And then we're going to actually work on it for a while see what kind of solutions you come up with, discuss with your partner, and once, you, um, uh, w once the time is up, we're just gonna present like, this is how we did it, and we'll discuss why we did it and how we did it. So that way, you, you're not just gonna see uh, design patterns on the screen, you're actually gonna work with it and then see a working example of it. Um, so, uh, what are we gonna work on today? We're gonna build a, Gut a Gutenberg block. Uh, from um, um, and it's going to show you uh, social mentions. So uh, we're going to build, for example, a Twitter block, and it will, uh, based on if you type in WCIU, uh, is going to uh, show you all the tweets that are happening about uh, WCU. We um, we're going to do just a server side rendering, so it's be it's going to be PHP only. We have um, abstracted every everything away that has to do with Gutenberg. It's in the code, so you can see how we've done it, but. Uh, you'll be just focusing on the actual uh, code implementation, the, the, the pure logic that's required to solve the, the business requirements. Um, so, we're going to start with the, the first business requirement. Um, we're gonna, we have a client, Fictional, and he wants a Gutenberg block that, just, uh, that shows uh, Twitter mentions. So, um, here you can read what it's, uh, what it's about to do what we're gonna build. So I'll give you a few seconds to, uh, to read it. That was it. Um, so, and then we're gonna uh, do the exercise. The first exercise is really a thought exercise because we're gonna also use this time to set you up. The requirements for this workshop uh, are a, a working laptop. We're gonna do, um, we're gonna do, uh, we need a fresh WordPress install, so you need some sort of local host uh, working. And then um, we're going to help you through um, uh, the authentication uh, with uh, the WordPress and the Twitter uh, Gutenberg uh, APIs. It's, it's all been automated, so it should be like really 10 minutes. We have uh, some TAs over there that will help you. And some, oh, where's uh, Sorsen? <laughs> ah, he is, yeah, he, okay, there's some TAs yeah. hidden there as well. <laughs> they will help you set up uh, um, with this. Um, do we have the URL? Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Can you go? Uh, you go to sh uh, the GitHub page of uh, LN. He will put it in. Yeah. 
So does everyone have a local host running with a WordPress install? If it's uh, a fresh install, it's the best? Because uh, we're going to add some pages and stuff, and it's going to help if... Um, Yeah, so um, oh. this one has a readme. This to, uh, 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 <laughs> scroll, can I scroll to the readme? Yeah. How do I scroll to the? Um, take, go to the to the to the repo and and um, process the readme. It, it says there what the steps are, which what which are required. It will. We're just going to use uh, five to ten minutes to set everyone up now. And then we can actually uh, start. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, it's the wrong one. <laughs> this one is to every yeah. This is the correct one to go. So if you have any questions um, on setting up WordPress or um, on the repo or anything, just. Uh, Raise your hand, and um, we'll uh, we'll try to sort it out for you. I'm just going to take like uh, five to ten minutes uh, for everyone to set up. Uh, so just to state, the end result should be that you have installed two plugins that you got from GitHub as explained in the GitHub repository and activated both of them. So um, for those who, who are ready, you need a WordPress.com account and you need um, a Twitter account for this. Uh, workshop. Um, once you have installed those plugins, or uh, when, uh, if you activated all three of them, and you go to pages, you'll see a few pages uh, that should be generated uh, in, uh, in WordPress. The pages themselves don't contain any content, but if you view them on the front end, you'll see, you'll see uh, actually uh, uh, some rendering done. What, what everyone should do is, is create uh, a Twitter app and create a WordPress.com app then once you've done that, you can use the page that helps you uh, generate an open out token for WordPress.com. And once you've done that, you can go to the GitHub branches page. And then everyone is set up and good to go. If you have any questions or trouble, just, just raise your hand. We'll, one of the TAs or myself or Ellen will help out. So, so these are the pages that you should see. And just by uh, viewing them, you'll have uh, a brief tutorial on, uh, on what to do. The uh, env.php file, you can find it in the um, WCUO 2018 resources uh, plugin. You have a file env.php there, and that's where you'll have to place those tokens.
So in the meantime, for those who, who don't use Composer uh, all the time, the, the reason that we're using it here is that we set up auto-loading using Composer. So even though, for example, the resources plugin, it doesn't load in any external dependencies, we still use it so we don't, we don't require our PHP classes by hand. We just instance new class and Composer takes care of the, of the loading of it. Uh, so just a quick note, uh, because it might be something that uh, other people are struggling with. If your domain that you're using on local machine happens to contain the word WordPress, then this will not wor uh, work to create a WordPress.com API app because they think you're infringing on their trademarks. <laughs> this will not work. You need to use a domain that does not contain the word WordPress. <laughs> The uh, WordPress.com API authentication is also uh, optional. So if you really have trouble getting it to work, we can still continue with the workshop. You will get pretty weird results if you're not authenticated because it just uses whatever local cookie it finds for your user and gives you random results based on that. But the workshop itself will still be able to, to, to work forward. So. Um, we, we need to move on. You can continue working on this uh, while, while you're trying to uh, get everything set up. But we need to slowly move on because we want to cover a lot. Um, so the uh, Git branch that you see uh, printed here, that's the first uh, step in the code that will uh, provide you with the clean Gutenberg block where you can start implementing your Twitter client. But um, we will not have the time to actually work on that first implementation. So we will move on from there. But uh, this is actually the code that would provide uh, a clean, uh, clean canvas from which to store the actual server-side implementation. So um, we, we just assume now that everyone has this Gutenberg block uh, running with uh, the first requirement all fulfilled with a Twitter uh, API request that fills it with uh, with the mentions on Twitter. And now our client all of a sudden gives us uh, a new business requirement. We need to add a second feed. So we only planned in the beginning to, to just implement a basic Twitter API access. So uh, we might even have hard coded all of the Twitter logic into our code, into our block. Now the client needs, to, needs us to add a second feed to this. Um, so this is why we uh, already requested two different APIs for you to authenticate with. The client now requests us to use WordPress.com as well, uh, side by side with uh, Twitter. So the Gutenberg block is meant to let you choose which network to show uh, the mentions in, and then you can dynamically switch between these two. Uh, the second feed should pull this data from WordPress.com and we want to have the condi conditional code be kept to a minimum. So we don't want to have a big if-else clause where, where we basically duplicate the entire code path uh, for doing the remote requests and do it once for Twitter and once for WordPress.com. We want to be smart about this. Um, that's where uh, some of the first patterns come into play. First, I want to talk a bit about instantiation. So instantiation is uh, one of the most fundamental aspects of um, object-oriented programming. You create classes, and then you can instantiate these classes uh, to have objects. And um, the way you instantiate something controls the coupling between your objects and controls the life cycle of these objects. So uh, instantiation is, is something that should, um, that should uh, get a lot of thought and effort from you to really use it in the best possible way. Um, there's a few ways you can instantiate something. The most direct one is to use the new keyword in PHP. So you just do new and a class name 
and you get an instance of an object in return. The, uh, this, this causes immediate coupling to the class that you instantiated. So if you do a new my shiny class, then your code is immediately tightly coupled to my shiny class and cannot easily use any other implementation without first changing that code. Uh, you also need to know what the constructor arguments are, which uh, oftentimes is pretty simple, but sometimes the constructor arguments uh, might be very complex and it might be a lot of work to actually prepare them. Um, and a step forward from uh, using the new keyword is using named constructors. So instead of having the new keyword and one default constructor, you can have multiple constructors that create maybe multiple variations of an object or maybe you have different arguments to create that object. So that, um, that allows you uh, to have more control over how something is an instantiated and maybe automate some steps or, or do some validation, etc. And then, a step further away from this, we get our first pattern, which is the simple factory. The simple factory is a pattern that lets you get the instantiation of something, uh, of some object, uh, away and put it into a different object so that that object has as its sole responsibility to instantiate another object. That might sound a bit uh, useless at first, so why would I need two objects to instantiate one object? Um, the point about this is that this simple factory can be passed around. This simple factory is an object in its own right, so can have its own logic. You can... Uh, you also have this logic encapsulated so you can change the way uh, something is instantiated after the fact, after it was uh, used in some other place of the code, and that other place does not need to be adapted. So you've put away the exact way of instantiating something so that you have one central place of changing it in case you need it. Here's an example of how such a simple factory could work. Uh, this is not necessarily the exact code that uh, we would use in our Gutenberg block. It happens to be similar here as an example. Uh, we have a social network interface and multiple implementations of this interface. And instead of uh, immediately instantiating a specific implementation, we create a factory. This is the simple factory pattern. We create a factory that lets us abstract away the decision process of deciding which implementation to instantiate. And here at the bottom you can see how this is used. Let's say we have a function that, that we pass some string uh, to, to denote which uh, network we need. This string might, for example, be an option in the database or uh, the value of an input field. And then we get just pass this to our network uh, factory and the factory then returns some implementation. We don't need to know which implementation that was returned. That is not needed at this point. And whatever implementation we get, we just use its, its rendering method. Um, so, given that you have multiple ways of instantiating something, when should you use the new keyboard, uh, the keyboard keyword? Uh, because most of the time, uh, people just default to the new keyword and use it for, for all the instantiations that they need. The new keyword sh should only be used for newable types, which is uh, types that, um, that are meant to be instantiated on the spot immediately. Uh, exceptions would be an example of this. Uh, value objects would be an example, like for example, the date time uh, object you will not create a factory to create implementations of date time. You will just use it as is. Um, and inside of any type of factory, of course, you can use the new keyword. And ideally, the entire rest of your code would not have the new keyword anywhere and, as an effect, not have any tight coupling 
to the decisions that are need that need to be made of which which implementation to use for which interface. What comes along with uh, working with these objects is dependency injection. We will have several different examples uh, throughout this workshop of how dependency injection is used. I want to start with a click, uh, quick ex explanation of it. So dependency injection is basically uh, instead of requesting a given implementation from within a code, you just have it be passed into the code from the outside, from the surrounding code. Um, the, uh, this sounds very straightforward and it basically means in most of the cases that your object has its dependencies injected through constructor arguments. So when, when you instantiate an object and it needs dependencies, then you instantiate it by immediately passing it the, the dependencies it needs so that the object does not need to ask for these dependencies itself. Here you can uh, see a code example. Uh, first, we have uh, the way of how not to do it. We have the MySQL database object, and we have some service that immediately instantiates, uh, directly instantiates this database and then uses it. This is now a very simplistic uh, example, but imagine that you have hundreds of these services which come with direct implementation uh, access to this one MySQL database. And now all of a sudden, your boss wants you to change to Oracle. And you have your entire code base riddled with direct references to this MySQL database. So that's why we want to inject the database instead. Here's a simplistic uh, example of this. So we just, oh, sorry, we just have the MySQL database as a constructor argument. And whatever we get, we just store it and make use of that stored version. This looks like it's still the, sim the same code as before, but there's an important uh, distinction. If we now extend this MySQL database, we can just inject the extended version without this code needing to change, because it doesn't include any direct reference to it. And uh, as you might even uh, uh, imagine right now, if you use an interface here instead of an actual class, then you're even more flexible. You can just have any implementation of that interface be injected. So what that causes in the end is the code you're writing, it, uh, it is very cowardly in that it just defers technical decisions instead of immediately needing to decide, okay, which database implementation do I need? We can just say, okay, this code will work with some database. And we don't care which one it is yet, we just care about which, which data we retrieve. So the decision on which implementation to use is deferred to a later moment. So we don't need to deal with this decision immediately. This also means that the code that we've just built does not depend on this decision. And if this decision is ever changed in the future, we don't need to adapt our code because it didn't rely on that decision from the first place. And if we now think through of what that means for our entire application, uh, you can say that dependency injection always moves the instantiation of dependencies one level up. But it can do this recursively uh, across the entire object tree or object graph. So normally your application is a very complex tree of objects that, that are interrelated and dependency injection can move all of the instantiations, so all of the technical implementation detail decisions, out of the leaves of this tree and up to the root. And this is called the composition root. So basically what we have is we want the new keywords to all be regrouped in one central location. So all the rest of the code, if we need to make a change in any of these technical decisions, 
All the rest of the code does not need to be adapted. We just make a change in the composition route, and that's it, we're good to go, provided that we build the code correctly, of course. So there, uh, there's the next exercise, and now it's getting a bit realer. So the branch you want to work on is to feed me. Uh, we want to add the second feed to the code, and we want to do this using a, a simple factory, an implementation of the sim uh, simple factory pattern. And uh, this means that uh, we create a feed factory which when given, uh, given a, a, a specific string like Twitter or WordPress will return an instance of the application uh, of the implementation uh, to use. So. Uh, so do a checkout of uh, the branch to feed me, look into the code uh, it already contains an implementation of the Twitter uh, feed and uh, you can think about what you need to change now to add the WordPress.com feed. Um, uh, one, someone pointed out that it's, it's actually important that you actually use the Git uh, repo and uh, not download the zip because you won't be able to, uh, to switch branches. Um, if you you can find that one of the pages I created uh, where they were created they contain all the branches for today and they ha also have a tutorial on how to um, to swap between them also my bad um, the WordPress authentication was a bug so uh, I, um, I, I I typed something wrong which this is why you couldn't uh, authenticate so if you um, for though it's optional what I'm saying now you c if you pull in the resources, the latest version, you should be able to authenticate with WordPress. Again, it's not required, but it does give you proper results. Yeah. Also, uh, uh, some, some small hints. Um, there's, a, there's a class called plugin in the code. It, 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 it explains what we're doing here. So if you go to the plugin class, you will see what we're doing, and this is, this is a good point to start working. Just, just with your coworker, uh, start working on it. Um, if you have questions, it doesn't matter. Or hesitations, just raise your hand. We're here to do something interactive. We're gonna work on this for like 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, so I see you're all busy. I hope it's uh, busy with discussing the solution, not the authentication still. <laughs> uh, we'll move on. Um, just uh, again, the authentication is... Um, the, the worst case is that if you have no Twitter authentication, uh, you will get no results from Twitter, and if you have no WordPress.com authentication, you will get random results from WordPress.com, but still get results, so you can still use the blog for the, for the further work. So uh, that's why we added that uh, API as well. So we're moving on now to the um, to the next step. So in comes our client, and has a great idea. Um, it's very expensive to run all the updates of this server-side rendered block all the time. So the client wants us to add caching to remove some of the bandwidth that is being used uh, by all the time updating. Um, now, um, this is where um, the design patterns and the object-oriented approach and dependence injection start to become very interesting. So, first of all, here's the business requirements we have. We want to do some short-term uh, short caching, five minutes, uh, just to avoid uh, doing a lot of uh, remote requests at the same time. But five minutes is so short that it still seems to be updated in real time. We want to implement this caching without 
changing the feed implementation. So we don't want to go into the Twitter feed and add caching, and then go into the WordPress.com feed and add caching. That's not how we want to work. So we want to just leave the, the feed implementations as they are without any single line of code changed. We also want to implement this caching without changing the code that consumes the feed data, because we might not even be aware where this code is used uh, in the code base. So there might be several different places in the code where the feed is being uh, used for rendering or whatever. We, we, we're not sure. So we prefer to build something that does not require any changes. This is where the decorator comes in. The decorator is another pattern. Uh, in this instance, we're using it for caching. So a quick mention about what caching represents in terms of a software engineering concept. Caching is something uh, that we call a cross-cutting concern. Uh, a cross-cutting concern is something that is very difficult to put into one single place in your code base and just say, okay, this is the corner where the caching is. It is a cross-cutting concern because it, it cuts through all the concerns of your code and is oftentimes something that needs to be done to all sorts of places of your code. Um, that's what makes it so difficult uh, to, to do it properly. Another uh, type of uh, cross-cutting concern would be uh, logging, for example. You don't log in one corner of your code. When you add logging, it's to log the rest of the code to know what's going on in there. So these are cross-cutting concerns. And when we want to add cross-cutting concerns in such a way that we are still uh, adhering to all the principles we want to adhere, like the single responsibility principle, or uh, we want to keep all the concerns separated, um, then uh, this is where the decorator comes in. The decorator adds a new responsibility to an existing object without changing that ob object. And it does this by wrapping the existing object and attaching its own code um, in the same way. So it interjects between the producer of something and the consumer of that same thing. And to show you how, how this would be uh, displayed visually, Let's imagine that this crook line, whatever it is, let's imagine that this is an interface. So the interface has a specific shape and whatever we build to implement this interface, it needs to match this shape. So when you have an interface, it normally tells you, okay, you need this and this method. And so any implementation also needs to implement this and this method. Here's our interface. We have producing code, that means code that actually implements the interface and produces what the interface is meant to return. And we have consuming code that uses whatever implementation you've provided to, to implement this interface. And now when we're talking about a decorator, it means that we split this up without changing them, we just split them up. We put a decorator in place which um, which accepts an interface of the thing we want to decorate, and the decorator implements the same interface as well. So it acts as a, as a middleman, and neither the producer nor the consumer uh, have to change. They just never notice that something else happened. And here's an example now of how this would look in code. So we have... Um, a data interface, uh, and we have a renderer that uh, accepts an implementation of this data, phase, uh, data interface and uh, fetches the data and returns it. Very simple code. We have one implementation, uh, a remote data implementation of this data interface that does remote request when you, when you call its uh, get method. And here you can see how the code is being used. We instantiate remote data, we inject the remote data into the renderer, and when we call the renderer's render method, it will do this remote request. So now imagine we want to add caching in there. The straightforward approach would be to add the caching in here. 
The problem now is, though, we needed to change our implementation. Maybe that implementation was not even part of our code. Maybe we just pulled this in as the third-party dependency through Composer. Uh, also, now this remote data, it does two things. It does remote request and it caches the remote request. So out goes the single, re single responsibility principle. So the way we want to do this is actually a different one. We create, uh, create a new object that only deals with the caching and that object is a decorator. So that means the object accepts an implementation of our interface and it implements the interface as well. We can see here that our remote data is clean again. It doesn't need to change just to add caching. And here you can see how we use it. We have our remote data implementation and we pass it into the cache data. So we wrap the remote data with the cache data and the renderer can then still accept this because it does not notice the difference between re a direct remote data or a cached, direct, uh, cached remote data. So if you call render or render, it still does the same thing and it never notices that we've introduced a middleman that added the caching. Uh, this has a few uh, benefits. One is that you can apply this to code that is not your own, third-party code you pull in as dependencies, which means that you can uh, consider a lot of the code that you create that is reusable as just third-party code that is not meant to be changed, which main, uh, makes maintenance easier. It also means that um, when we add testing to our code, um, basically, as long as we don't make changes to tested code, we can always just assume it works and no, don't need to bother with it, don't need to uh, spend any thought on, uh, on it. Um, and the decorator lets us add new functionality without changing the code that was already tested, that was known to work. Because as soon as we make a change, there's no guarantee that that change doesn't break the existing code. Uh, here's a few tips uh, of how and when to use the decorator. As I said, it's especially useful for adding cross-cutting concerns, but that's not the only uh, the only purpose. Uh, but it's just um, it's a typical usage of it. And the decorator also works very well when you have a central place where you decide what gets instantiated and how it gets injected into other objects because then you have one central place where you can inject this middleman and all the rest of your code will never notice the difference. Here's the next exercise. So we want to add a caching layer through a decorator. This starts in the branch three cache is king. So the uh, feed object should be wrapped into a caching decorator so that we end up with a caching feed and we want to use short expiration transient caching for this so just use the WordPress get transient and set transient methods uh, uh, to, um, to do the actual um, caching in this instance. Uh, what time uh, is available for this exercise? Uh, we have 20 minutes uh, so again it's mostly about discussing this and starting to figure out how to build these objects. It's, not, um, it's no problem if you don't manage to finish it. Uh, the important part is the discussion and the thought process of how to go about this. Um, if you have uh, written some code in the, in the previous branch, uh, you can just swip to, swap to this branch, so you have to stash your results. If you have the latest version of the resource uh, repository, it will show you one of the pages how to stash and then switch your branch. Also, in the last exercise, we ask you to create a factory. If you go to plugin.php uh, and to feedfactory.com, uh, .com, .php, um, you will see the implementation that we wrote to do this. So uh, before you start with this exercise, check, check this branch out. And once you've done it, check out plugin.php and feedfactory. So, you can see what, 
how we implemented the theory we discussed in the, in the previous problem, and then start on this one. Just, uh, just a quick note again, um, in case you need a break, um, as our time is very short, um, all, uh, always when we do exercises, if you need to get a quick break, if you need to go to the restroom or so, feel free to do it during the exercises and know that the completed code will still be there for you when you return. So um, we don't have a specific time period reserved uh, for, for break. Okay, uh, we'll move on to the next step, uh, but first of all, I wanted to quickly show you uh, what the caching feed should look like. So, um, uh, a lot of you have already understood how the decorator works and uh, could uh, quickly build uh, a first implementation of it. So the important pieces of the, the of the decorator is it implements the interface we want to uh, wrap and it also accepts the actual current implementation we want to wrap. We want to add another behavior to. And um, if we now scroll down, we can see that basically the, the interface is this get entries method and we still have this get, get, entries, uh, get, ad, get entries method, sorry about that. And we add caching to it, and if the cache misses, we forward our get entries call to the actual uh, wrapped object instead. That's the main, uh, main uh, functioning principle of the decorator. So, um, now, um, if, if you want to see the solution in your own code, you can check out the branch 3 cache is king final. But we will now move on. We will now move on to our next business requirement. So, the client comes, again, comes in again and has a new idea. Um, on the production server, we want to use object caching, not transient caching, because the client now noticed that while well, transient caching is not as good as it, as it is hyped. So on the production server, we have something like Redis uh, available, some persistent object cache, so we want to use object caching instead. Um, some requirements for, for this new uh, change the caching just should support different caching engines. So, um, b basically, we already noticed now that having one implementation is not enough. We need to make the code more flexible. And if you're already doing it, then uh, it's a good opportunity to abstract away the detailed implementation of whatever caching engine we're using. So we, s we, remain, we remain flexible uh, in the future. Uh, we also want to keep the duplicate logic uh, to a minimum again. And the consuming code should still remain completely unaware of what we did uh, to change the caching. So the exercise now is to keep the caching feed that you've built now. You will probably have all version now if you uh, check out the new branch. Um, use this caching feed and inject a caching engine into the feed. So this will show us that not only uh, can we inject code and we can uh, use decorators, but we can also inject into decorators. Basically, design patterns are meant to mix and match as needed. You can 
uh, stack them, you can wrap them in, in each other, you can use them in whatever creative ways you can think of. So here we're using dependency injection to make our decorator more flexible. Um, the, um, we should have an abstract caching engine and we want to have multiple uh, implementations and then inject it into the caching feed decorator. You can check out the git branch for test me if you can. Um, which is yeah. Um, yeah, the, the name is a bit uh, misleading because uh, that was a different exercise at one point. Yeah, just use a branch for test me if you can and try to create an abstract caching engine that you can inject into the caching feed decorator. Uh, 20 mani minutes for this and again if someone needs to use the restrooms or so this is a good time to do so. So we are uh, continuing with the exercises. Um, a quick note about uh, the code we've built now. If you check out the branch for test me if you can final, you can see the implementation that we've built. That was the end goal as we had uh, uh, as we had suggested it. And basically, we have created an abstract class caching engine, which includes three methods. Uh, a remember method, a read method, and a write method. Um, we, did it, we, we did it this way because an abstract class can still be considered an interface. It's not an implementation because you cannot instantiate it, but it already can come with default behavior that, that, you, cannot, um, that you cannot just skip. And in this case, the default behavior we wanted to add is our remember algorithm. So instead of having just a read and write method and always needing to go through the entire steps of, okay, let's do read. If the read was, uh, if the read failed, then we know the cache did it was a miss, then we need to generate, then we do a write, etc. So this entire algorithm, if we only have read and write method in our caching engine, we would need to do this algorithm in every single place where we use our caching. And we wanted to avoid that. That's why we have a remember method to abstract away this algorithm so we have it in one place and if we would need to, we'd need if we need to do a change with that algorithm, we can do that change in the one place. And all the other places where we're using the caching will just use the new behavior and, and be good without any uh, necessary changes. Uh, okay, uh, I think we go to the slides. Ah, yeah. Um, so the caching engine is then injected into a decorator, which means we can do this in one single location, namely in the feed factory. Uh, so the feed factory, which already wraps our feed in a cached feed, can just provide the caching engine to the, uh, to the uh, feed, uh, to the cached feed decorator. And this is, uh, this is all instantiated at the composition root and passed down the tree uh, through dependency injection. So the caching, uh, the caching engine, if you go to the uh, composition route, and plug in. So the caching engine is instantiated in one place and we inject it into the feed factory. And the feed factory will inject it into our caching feed decorator. So even if we might end up with a thousand places in our code that use caching, we have one single location where, you, where we can decide which engine to use. If we need to use another one, it's one single change. Okay, we can head back to the slides now.
So, um, the last pattern we want to cover, and we need to go a bit quicker now um, because time is slowly running out. The last pattern we want to cover is the strategy pattern. So, the strategy pattern allows you to abstract away an entire family of algorithms so you can easily switch them at runtime in whatever way you want without the rest of the code being aware of it. Um, this makes algorithms uh, reusable and it also means that you can easily add new algorithms without any extensive changes in the rest of your code. So here's an example of the strategy pattern. This looks a bit, bit complicated now. Basically, we have a user list that we want to sort based on several criteria. We can sort them by phone, by email, and by name. And as you can see, depending on which criteria we want to use, the algorithms are quite different between these. And here's just the consuming code. Uh, we, we load a CSV file, we uh, add the users, and then we can grab them by a sorted criteria. Now to use the strategy pattern, we can uh, basically do, um, uh, we can put the actual implementation of the algorithms into separate classes. So here on the right side, you see the sort by name, sort by email, and sort by phone, that all contain a compare method. This is because we created an interface sort order that has a compare method to compare uh, two users with each other. And now when we look at our user list and the function gets sorted by, it's drastically simpler. It's just a use sort, so that's a PHP uh, function uh, to sort based on a custom callback that you pass to the function. So we sort the users array and we use our compare method as the callback. And we even um, injected, uh, well, no, we didn't inject here, but we could inject. Uh, so the uh, criteria here is the one we get by the get sorted by uh, methods argument. And we don't even know which one it is, we just know that it will be some algorithm to compare users and we just use it. And when you look at the consuming code here, uh, you probably can't uh, remember all of it, but um, I can attest that it's mostly unchanged. The only thing that changed is that here our criteria is not some random string, but it's an instance of the actual cr uh, sorting criteria we want to use. So that's the strategy pattern, which is also a very powerful pattern. Uh, as you can see, uh, the code that does the actual sorting is very simple now and if you need to add a, a fourth or a fifth uh, sorting criteria now it's just a matter of uh, creating a new implementation of the sort order interface. A few tips uh, if uh, you want to look at how to use the strategy pattern it's often if you see big switch statements or long if else chains um, that's often a good indicator that you can use a strategy pattern and you can also combine the strategy pattern with uh, a factory so that you don't oh sorry so that you don't need to know the actual class to use but can just defer this to a factory to instantiate it so we can have a random argument and instantiate the actual implementation through factory so the exercise then, uh, it's in branch 5, sort it out. Uh, introduce an audit feed decorator, uh, which should sort uh, the entries based on abstract comparison lo logic object. So you can probably already guess that this is meant to apply the strategy pattern. And provide multiple sorting algorithms uh, we, um, in our case, we uh, use by publication date, by author name, and by content length to have a bit of a, a variation in the algorithms. But feel free to be creative and use something else. Uh, a quick note, uh, the audit feed decorator 
does not mean that it replaces the cached feed decorator. Decorators are stackable. You can just decorate a decorator which decorates another decorator and go on and on. Um, you just need to pay attention to the order in which you stack them. So here, as we're dealing with caching, uh, you need to think about whether the caching or the, or, or the ordering should come first and how to stack them in which order. Uh, so, um, we'll continue on to wrap up slowly. Uh, first of all, uh, the branch to see the final code is six. That's all, folks. Um, so you can check out that branch to see what we finally come, uh, came up with to build uh, this uh, Gutenberg block. Here's an overview of the uh, here's a view of the ordered feed decorator that now includes our um, our strategy pattern. So uh, in the constructor, in the constructor, you can see that we are injecting a sorting strategy implementation. And if you, we look at the get entries implementation, further down. Um, so we still retrieve the get entries from the feed that we're wrapping, but then we order its entries and return the ordered entries. And in this order entries method, uh, we can see that we're using usort to use whatever strategy uh, that was injected and call this strategy's compare pattern as the callback for sorting. So this does sort uh, our entries, but does completely ignore how they are uh, being sorted. That's a different object, a different responsibility. Uh, just a, as a quick example, um, hit up the uh, by author name or something, some strategy. Yeah, just hit enter. Okay, no, that was not it. But yeah, that's also uh, very nice. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> no, it's not sort by. It's it starts by by, by author name by, because yeah, there's, this one yeah. Okay, so here's one example. Basically, uh, we do an implementation of the interface, of the sorting strategy interface, and this interface just says that we need to have a compare method that compares two feed entries and returns an int value. The usual way uh, sorting algorithms in PHP are being used is that they return um, less than, equal, or greater than zero based on whether the first ent entry is, um, is smaller equal or greater than the second one, respectively. Um, and in this case, to, to implement this, we uh, use the get author name from both feed entries. Uh, to make sure that we have a fair fight, we uh, only use lowercase letters for both of them. And we use the spaceship operator here uh, that basically returns this integer value uh, that we need. And this is just one simple implementation of a, of a strategy, and we can have whatever creative ways we need uh, to sort them. Um, okay, let's get back to the slides. Uh, so, let's move on from here. I, uh, before we, we close off, I wanted to quickly um, show you an optional homework uh, exercise you can do. Another 
pattern that we, that we haven't discussed yet, which is also very interesting and also nicely fits into the plugin here. But we won't uh, show you the finished implementation. This is something you should figure out on yourself uh, at home. So the abstract factory is basically still a step beyond the abstraction level that a simple factory provides. The abstract factory abstracts away factories. So, um, which sounds like quite a mouthful, but uh, what, that, what that means is that you have an object that can create, instantiate other objects, and it doesn't even depend itself on any specific way of instantiating these objects. This can be extended, even by third-party code. So to better show you what this means, let's assume Gutenberg was built in a clean PHP and would contain an abstract block factory that has separate factories for each family of blocks. So we have simple factories here and the abstract factory abstracts away the fact that there are multiple ones. And when Gutenberg requests a block, it will just request it from the abstract block factory and whoever is responsible will retrieve the correct in implementation. And the big advantage of this is that we can create a plugin that hooks into the abstract block factory and registers an additional factory which can instantiate new blocks that were not part of the core Gutenberg experience and all of this works without changing a single line of code in the Gutenberg plugin. So this makes it immediately extensible and third-party code can easily add factories to add instantiations of implementations. So uh, as a home exercise, please think about how you could extend the code so that another plugin could add, could add a third feed implementation to this uh, social mentions block. Um, yeah, okay, um, that's the slide. <laughs> um, yeah, you need to think about uh, providing some form of registration mechanism that the external plugin can hook into to get access to this abstract factory. That's the difficult part about this. And um, yeah, uh, you can Google about how the abstract factory is built but I think that by now what you've seen will probably make it very straightforward of what uh, the actual implementation of an abstract factory will look like. Um, the key takeaways of this session, hopefully, is that um, design patterns are not copy-paste snippets. Design patterns are ways of um, thinking about a solution that has shown to be uh, preferable in the long term and applying, this, uh, applying it in different contexts. Um, these design patterns can take all sorts of different shapes and forms if you use them in, in real life. They not always are exactly like the example code you see in the academic books, but that doesn't mean uh, that they are not these patterns. It's just about a conceptual way of solving a specific problem. And when you will go through the code that we've provided uh, to you, there's other parts of the code that abstract away all the, the Gutenberg block stuff. Uh, there's, uh, you already started with quite a lot of code. And if you go through this in detail, you will see that there's all sorts of other instantiations of these patterns. You will find additional factories, you will find additional decorators. And I think that I managed to always denote in the file header doc blocks of each class when they uh, represent a given design pattern. So, so you will find more examples of them inside of the example code. Another key takeaway should be that dependency injection lets you defer decisions. So whenever you can defer de a decision, uh, you can be uh, much lazier and not care with all the technical details that would normally need to be solved and just use a concept 
don't use a given implementation. Just use a concept and trust that at one point we will solve the issue of knowing which implementation to use. But we always want to defer this decision. Deferred decisions mean that when the decision changes, our code doesn't need to change because it didn't, didn't rely on that decision in the first place. And as a third uh, takeaway, um, when, uh, when you apply these design patterns and when you apply dependency injection, these are all building blocks and you can combine them, you can mix and match them. You can combine a decorator with a factory and inject and uh, wrap and whatever. And there's no limit to what you can build with these basic building blocks. Uh, finally, um, if this has proven to be interesting to you, if this has shown you that design patterns can be a useful tool for you, then know that there are probably at least 80 more of them to discover. Um, this was only a small sub, uh, subset of the available patterns that are documented today. Um, we unfortunately needed to limit the scope of this workshop. But uh, if you uh, Google about design patterns, if you uh, look into books about design patterns, you will find a lot of other patterns like this. And maybe now that you've seen how to apply them in real life, uh, this will help you get through the academic mumbo jumbo that comes with the design pattern explanations. And you can more easily see how you can use them for your problems and how, how you can apply them in your actual daily life and make it easier. Yeah. Um, David, is there anything else uh, you want to add? Yeah, okay. um, so thank you all uh, for participating in the workshop. Feel free to also ask questions. Um, if you have them, uh, you can contact both of us on Twitter. Uh, we're also available on Slack. Um, we're always happy to help. Uh, we uh, we uh, really care about helping make the general code better because we also need to deal with it every day. So <laughs> please help us all together make our own environment better. And uh, also a big thank you to the TAs who did a fantastic job of uh, helping everyone get up to speed and get moving. Thank you.